Aloha! Hey, what's up everyone? I love seeing everyone pop into the chat whenever we're watching the intro. It's my it's my favorite part. So hey, I'm JJ Burns and today we're doing uh, Truth in Movies. So uh, normally we do it on Monday, but today we're doing it uh, tonight. So tonight we're going to check out this movie that I a lot of you guys actually recommended to me called Love and Monsters. And this is pretty exciting. It's a pretty awesome movie. So I talk about Phantazoids on my channel a lot. And for those of you who are new, Phantazoids are basically those otherworldly creatures that live outside of our realm. And when the sky opens up occasionally during the plasma apocalypse, they're allowed entry. They can come down into our world. So they take the shape of monsters and the Leviathan and the Behemoth and dinosaurs and all sorts of strange, you know, otherworldly type monsters that occasionally come into our world. And we have these tales of knights fighting them and samurai and special, special ops being sent out to like destroy and find these giants and monsters. So that's what this uh, movie is basically about. If you've ever seen King Kong, that island that King Kong lives on, uh, that is a uh, Skull Island. That's exactly what we're talking about. That portrays it beautifully. Now, um, a couple things are going to happen, okay? So I want to point this out. One, those otherworldly phantasoids will come down into our world. And two, whenever our world depressurizes and gravity is lessened, right, after the apocalypse happens, then life will just grow much larger. Anything that's born into that world is going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger human life, animal life, insect life, etc., and so on and so forth. <laughs> hey, what's up to everybody in the chat too, by the way? The Good Vibe Tribe showed up tonight. So anyway, that's what we're talking about when we talk about Phantasoids. That's what this movie's about. So let's check out some of the clips. So at the beginning of the movie, this is where we start off, right? They're talking about the apocalypse. I love how they always portray the apocalypse because every single apocalyptic scenario in my mind, according to my research, has happened, will happen, and is a part of the entire plasma apocalypse. Which, by the way, I did write a book about, so if you want to check out my book, feel free. So at the very beginning, I find this interesting. They have the, they have the whole an asteroid hit our world scenario, right? <laughs> Which, that's a part of it. You know, there will be asteroids, there will be falling stars, there will be everything that is included in every end of the world scenario, I believe all happening at one time. So in this scenario, they have this rock headed towards uh, the world, right? Which basically, according to my studies, is basically impossible. So the whole story about how the dinosaurs were wiped out um, with like this big comet, boom, hitting one side of this ball that's spinning and wobbling and stuff, and this sort of fire that wraps around the world, it, it seems kind of ridiculous to me. But I believe that there's some truth to be uh, found in that story. So anyhow, they go, they cut to this uh, scene. This guy's drawing out this book. He's got a post-apocalyptic book, which is a theme throughout the movie that I love because I highly encourage this. These are the types of books that survivors will write that will become um, considered sacred, okay? I mean, I don't know if you'll be writing like the next Bible or Quran or whatever, but your writings will be important. Whatever you document about what's happening will be important. Ultimately, that's why we have cave paintings and stuff and all these drawings where people are trying to draw what they saw in the sky happening and their perspective on the result. So in this movie, uh, there was this there was this uh, meteor that came down and everyone shot their missiles at it, right? This is ridiculous. They shot their missiles at it, and I guess the nuclear debris or whatever rained down onto our world, and somehow in the movie had an effect on like the reptilian life, the animal life, the plant life, and uh, the insect life in particular, but not human life, which I thought was pretty interesting as well. <laughs> hey, what's up to Yamate in the chat? Somebody joined uh, as a member earlier, too, while I was, like, getting everything set up. So, hey, welcome. Welcome. It's good to see you guys. Anyway, so this is basically going to show you what's happening during the plasma apocalypse. Now, the movie is going to blame it on the radioactive material that fell back down from our rockets. But 
what it really is, is it's just the plasma apocalypse in effect. This is showing you the world that is to come. The new age, the next age, the next epic. He says that everything started to change. Did you see that earlier slide? He said it rained back down on us and everything changed. And by changed, I mean mutated and started eating us to death. So the X-Men, the, the concept of mutants and whatever is also um, possible. You know, it's possible for mutants to occur whenever you have all this radioactive uh, material raining down on you in the form of energy or plasma that's coming into our world and bettering us and making us better and strengthening us at the molecular level and our genetic level and our DNA is being changed and we're adapting to a completely energetic state in our world. All right, so he says ants, lizards, roaches, crocodiles, you name it, there's a lot of them. So when we talk about phantasoids, there's a lot of different types of phantasoids that exist in the next age, okay? Monsters, um, great beasts, fantastic beasts. Um, there's so many different names for these types of otherworldly monsters or beings that are being portrayed in our movies a lot these days, right? What happens is some drop down from above. Usually they're... they're um, you know, kind of a whitish color, a pearlescent, opalescent, kind of dull gray color all at the same time. And that's how they're portrayed in the movies, almost always, right? And uh, also on top of that, everything in our world that's born into that world starts to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. The plant life, the animal life, the insect life, like we said. So the insects grow. Now you and I who survive, we may grow a bit more but not as much as those who are born into this world. So we'll still kind of remain small, relatively speaking, as uh, a lengthened lifespan is granted to us and we continue to live for hundreds of years. And we remain sort of a similar size. We probably continue to grow, but those beings born into that world will get bigger and bigger and bigger because of less gravitational pull and because of the influx of energy that's in our world, strengthening those spirits and bodies and souls. So it says here 95% of the population was wiped out. That's probably about what you could expect, you know, every cycle that happens. So not a lot of people survive, you know. Um, I think it's a sad thing. However, uh, not a lot of people are nice these days. So it's kind of like, nah, all right, let's start over. So this is an interesting picture. Um, this reminded me of... Raised by Wolves. You guys were telling me to watch Raised by Wolves. Remember? I totally did, by the way. Um, man, it's a really good series. But this reminds me of like how they start digging in the ground. They find those weird monster bones. They never talk about them in that show, right? But basically, that's what we have here. These are your fossils and dinosaurs and um, you know other things that sank down into the mud whenever the liquefaction occurred from the world, uh, worldwide earthquakes and shaking. By the way, if you want to get my attention in the chat, feel free to just type in at JDreamers and I'll be happy to respond. Uh, so he says, it was easier in the beginning before we ran out of bullets. So hey, in the post-apocalyptic world, yeah, you might have some guns for a while, but most people are probably going to shoot all of the ammunition and run out of bullets. So you're going to have to improvise just like they did in the movie. They're going to make these weapons out of um, farm tools and things of that nature, which is recorded in the Bible, which is recorded in ancient ninjutsu and, you know, other things where people took common everyday tools and had to fashion them into weapons, you know, and then of course certain ninja became samurai and the samurai donned the armor of the phantasoids themselves. So this is just a picture I took of uh, this guy who he, you can first see the phantasoid. And a lot of times there's different kinds of phantasoids. And I want to give you guys a sneak peek of my website uh, when we're done so that we can kind of check out the different types of phantasoids that there are. So you'll see there's different classes, right? There's sort of a bug class, multiple arms, usually about six arms or so where they crawl around. This is uh, where the apocalypse kicked off. Now when the movie kicked off, there was a breach. So this breach was down underground into their little, uh, their little safe haven that they had made. That breach was symbolic of the phantasoids breaching into our world. This right here is symbolic of this guy and this girl they were about to make out in the car and get busy together. 
And that's the marriage. That's the marriage symbolically of the male and female coming together, which is the sky and the earth coming together when the sky opens up and this uh, this polar shift takes place, right? So you see these sparks shooting up from the ground. This is like the red lights. The red lights are your symbol that the plasma apocalypse is being shown to you in the movies because, you know, you get the red sky basically when the light reverses and goes the opposite way during... The polarity shift. This was a picture I took of a phanazoid. You can't really see it though. Let me see if I can zoom in. So this is, you know, huge basically. And there's different kinds with different sizes and whatnot. But basically the ones that come down from above are gigantic in comparison because they come from the, the macrocosm. Get lost in it is in the chat and says, J Dreamers, having a book like his would be cool. Oh, hey, thanks. I think my book's pretty awesome, honestly. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's my favorite book I've ever had. All right, so let's keep on going. All right, so this guy does something that's very smart. He starts drawing out the phanazoids that he experiences in the post-apocalyptic world. Not only does he draw a picture of them, but he draws like out their weaknesses, whether they're benevolent or malevolent. And he's this book is going to be a crucial part of the movie because he passes on... He, what he learns in this book to other people. He starts making other copies of this book so that they can have the information with them. And this guy talks about how the Phanazoid ripped through steel. These great beasts of old, these monsters of old um, that I have a video about on my Plasma Apocalypse series. They, according to legend, they're super strong. However, they also have a sort of exoskeletal structure. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them have this sort of exoskeletal structure, just like an ant would. Now imagine an ant can lift 50 times its own weight. Imagine an ant that's, you know, 20,000 times bigger than it really is or however big it really is. Um, it would be a pretty strong creature, right? Now this guy decides to go out there and brave the outer world with all these phanazoids walking around for how long? For seven days, right? The length of the plasma apocalypse, seven days. Seven days of creation. And this guy's like, oh, it's an impossible journey. You can't do it. This is what the movie is about. The movie is not about, are you good enough? Are you strong enough? Are you apt enough or smart enough to survive this movie is about having a brave attitude and facing and adapting to the changes in the world around you with a heart that is doing it out of love out of a place of um selflessness and that's what the whole movie's about this kid's on a journey to go meet his ex-girlfriend because he's in love with her right that's the reason why he's able to survive all of these different scenarios he's motivated by the greatest force that there is, which is love. And you'll see in a lot of these post-apocalyptic movies or apocalyptic movies, that's the types of people who tend to survive. The people who are trying to stay together, the people who are in love with each other or trying to find one another. That's a running theme that I believe is dropped to us as a breadcrumb saying, hey, it's not just about trying to survive this event. This event is happening for a reason and we want to bring the best type of people into the next age or into the next world, you know? So I took a picture of this because as you can see, they have him coming up and the grass is super tall, just like in the tall grass, which we broke down earlier. So that's, uh, you know, symbolic of all the vegetation that's going to grow, uh, gigantic vegetation all over the place at a rapid growth rate. Tony Smith is in the chat and says, Dreamers, is there a specific location in the United States that is the best place to be during the apocalypse? If you could pick any town or state to be in, which one would you choose? I would choose this one that I'm in right now um, because I feel led to be here. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, as far as you guys, what I always recommend to other people is to research your geography, research your local area, get to know, you know, how your geography works, the plants that you can eat and not eat, which we're going to see in this movie, uh, the dangers and possible safe places, research how much bedrock is in your area. You got to do your own research in your own little area to get the best answers. Nobody else in the world can tell you because you live in a different place with a different climate and different energies and electromagnetic structures and geography. So that's my best advice to you. All right, so in the movie, as you can see, they zoom in on this billboard. 
which is just a prop. It's been put in here purposefully, right? And it says, open yourself, what does it say? Open your piece of paradise. So they have this billboard pointing out this is paradise. This is the garden that Adam and Eve, you know, uh, came from. This is this is the forest realm of, um, man, what is it in Norse, Norse mythology? I totally forgot. Oh, leaf and leaf brazier. Right, this is their forest realm. They're like Adam and Eve in Norse mythology, basically. Anyhow, so we skip forward ahead. There's this huge giant frog. This is just showing you like the giant life. This is Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Every movie you've ever seen where people shrink down to a lower size, that's what they're showing you. This is showing you the post-apocalyptic world where everything is amplified and uh, has a lot more energy and lives a lot longer and grows to be a lot bigger. Now, this is pretty crucial. He's really hungry, so he just starts to basically eat a berry that he finds at random. Not a good idea. You got to take a time out. That's why I said study your local geography. St study those types of plants that grow in your area. That way you can know what's edible and what's not edible. And the plants, if you learn to listen to them, they'll tend to tell you, which we'll see here in a bit too. Patricia Dockery's in the chat and says, JJ Dreamers, reels can be seen in red. Can you speak on it? Okay, no idea what you're asking me. I'm sorry. Get lost in it says the dog saves him, aka God. Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. You're right. All right, so basically, uh, this guy falls into a pit where there's all these sandworms. They're basically baby sandworms, okay? And these are the types of uh, phantozoids that are the worm types. I'll show you guys when I get to my website. But there's these different types. Um, whenever our world's shaking up and there's all these worldwide earthquakes, right, you're going to have liquefaction, which brings the water to the surface and creates a lot of mud. So there's going to be these worm type phantozoids as well. And we'll check those out in a bit. Uh, then he meets these survivors. These guys actually didn't go underground. They learned to adapt to living on the surface. And you'll see that in a lot of these apocalyptic kind of movies, those that live on the surface and those that live underground, right? Uh, this movie is about braving to live on the surface, to coexist with the new world that has been presented to you. That's really what this movie's about. You can see there's a giant uh, phantasoid down there. And this one is where they introduce, this is basically a huge snail, okay? But this is where they introduce the concept that, hey, not all of these monsters are evil. Not all of these monsters are bad. They're not all out to kill you or get you. This snail in the movie is minding its own business, doesn't kill anyone. They walk right up on it. So they talk to it. They literally talk to this phantasoid, this creature, okay? Because I believe in the post-apocalyptic world, our world will have an influx of electromagnetics, which will strengthen your spirit, your aura. You'll be able to share feelings and thoughts and ideas through telepathy. And you'll be able to talk to animals, basically. Get Lost in It is in the chat and says, plus the dog slash God does not uh, get affected by the chemicals. Unchanged. Good point, too. So this, this girl says, why are you afraid? Boulder snails are nice. Right? Not all these phantasoids are just there for you to kill, which some people will do. You know, some people will probably create factions and they'll create their knights and their academies and they'll send special units out to kill these, you know, monsters or whatever. But not all of them, just because they're big or strange, doesn't mean they're evil, you know. Uh, so he says, there can be nice ones. She says, you can always tell in their eyes. Just look at their eyes. You can always tell, which is true for people and uh, animals, you know, as well, that you can tell by looking into their eyes. Now, I think that this has something to do with being plasma possessed in the post-apocalyptic world and having like the red eyes versus having like blue eyes. I'm not sure, but I think that's probably a little hint or a nudge on that. So this is where they go camping and they're like, they basically, this dude's eating dinner and he's getting ready to take us, uh, you know, go to bed. And they're like, nope, sorry, not both. You can either eat or you can sleep, not both. So I like this concept, even though it's kind of funny, but because it's very true. If you're out there camping in the wilderness and you're trying to survive and stuff, you have to be careful and you have to sort of balance out your survivability, right? Some nights, if you're going to cook a hot meal, you're going to attract phantasoids and monsters or whatever to where you are. So, hey, on that night, 
no sleep. You choose to eat on that night. There is sacrifices that we're going to have to make. We're not going to have shopping malls and Amazon.com and home delivery and pizzas sent to your house or anything like that. And people will, you know, obviously go after the stores where they keep the food and stuff like that. And that's only going to last for so long. You're going to have to learn how to live off of the land and discipline yourself as well. So they say, not both, not both. Now this plant, this guy stops and he points it out that this plant, um, he says, put this in your book. If you eat this plant, whenever you are poisoned by like slugs or something, um, it'll help you out. It'll, it's an anti-venom to their poison basically. And then he starts telling them because he's lived on the surface. So he has this experience with them, right? Uh, and the more experience we have collectively and we share with one another, the better off our odds are of surviving, right? He says that the insect looking ones have no peripheral vision, so they can't see to the side. The lizard looking ones can't climb. So he's giving him some tips for his little book, his little survival book that he's writing, right? The amphibian looking ones like to hide and lure you in and eat you whole. And then, he, and then he starts talking about the sandworms, basically, how they're pretty, pretty intense. Now he says, you can be sensible and come with us to the mountains, which I believe symbolizes, um, hey, I just got a donation from Mario Knows It's Flat. He says, here you go, Jay, sandwich and a coffee. Wow, right on. Hey, thank you. I appreciate you. That's awesome. But anyway, so this guy, is, this guy says we can go to the mountains, which symbolizes Mount Maru, going to the North Pole, going north. Um, or he can continue to go west, which is going in circles, basically, right? All right, so then he starts walking. He's on his trek. He's trying to look for his true love, and he ends up in a swamp. These swamp scenes are symbolic of the swamp world that you'll experience whenever, like I said, everything will um, become more liquefied through mud. There'll be lots of mud everywhere, and it'll be basically a swamp world for a little bit. Um, until all that water settles back down into the soil. But like I said, gravity is going to be a little weaker at first, so it'll probably be way more moist and take a lot more time for that water to drain than it would today. So we'll have a sort of swampy condition in our world. So when you see these swamp scenes, that's our world, okay? That's our post-apocalyptic world, very swampy and muddy. Then he sees this phantasoid pop up out of nowhere. It's basically some sort of giant centipede or something with all these different arms. I took a picture of this because I wanted to share that a lot of times the phantasoids in these movies, they're portrayed with these mouths within mouths. They have another mouth inside of their mouth that comes out. These are more like your sort of uh, leech kind of insect parasite type phantasoids, I suppose you would say. But they tend to like shoot out tendrils or things like that. And who knows? That's probably how they eat out there in the macrocosm, you know? That's why they seem so alien to us. All right. So moving on in the movie, I just want to take a picture of this one because it was kind of cool. Phantasoid sitting up like that. And then we come to this sort of robot. And these robots aren't really explained a lot in the movie. But this robot says, I have 51 minutes of power left and he's still alive, right? Now, this has taken place seven years after the apocalypse. So this robot has been on autopilot for seven years. So what I get out of that is the influx of energy that comes into our world that basically turns on the electronics in our world, right? Um, if that plasma that comes down into our world inhabits an electronic or robotic creature, then it brings it to life, basically. This is Skynet. This is, you know, all of the robots coming to life and artificial intelligence um, coming back to life and stuff. And this is what I see in this movie. Just like when we broke down um, Maximum Overdrive, same concept. And the Terminator and things like that. And uh, as you can see, the robot sort of has feelings too, right? It says it's hoping someone would find me. It's happy. It's sad. It's not just acting off of program, but it seems to be sentient. Now, this is the cool part. I like this part. I posted this in my stories mode, but I showed when these jellies, he calls them, he says, oh, look, sky jellies. They look up and they see these sort of jellyfish just floating around in the air. Well, we know in our world now, jellyfish can't just float around in the air. And we know that they're dropping us breadcrumbs of truth. So they're symbolic. They're symbolic of the phantasoids that 
float down into our world. The plasma itself, that's sort of jellyfish in nature, right? With its tendrils reaching down from a, a center point. And also um, the phantozoites that come down into our world. Was that, did I already say that one? I think I did. Anyways, I like it. He says they're harmless and quite lovely. There's plasma that will come down here that will not just zap you and petrify you and kill you. It depends on the strength of it, right? So you could probably imagine that there will be ball lightning and St. Elmo's fire and stuff, you know, giving us all kinds of interesting and beautiful exhibits to watch in the sky. Watcher Bears in the chat and says, what movie is this? This is called Love and Monsters. Here's another couple pictures I took. Oh, and then they play this song. So the music that they, that, that they choose in the movies is also just as important as the props that they put in the other symbols, right? So um, this is Stand By Me, right? And he says, when the night has come, when he's talking about the night coming, he's talking about the, the, way, uh, the day that the world goes dark, okay? The sun disappears. It's night everywhere. When the night has come and the land is dark, and the moon is the only light we'll see, right? He's, this whole song is about the plasma apocalypse. It's totally, uh, I have a plasma apocalypse play, uh, playlist. It's totally on it. Anyway, um, he's talking about not being afraid, okay? Not having that fear inside of you just as long as you stand by me. It's about love, okay? Surviving needs to be about love. If you want to survive, that's my advice, okay? Learn to be loving. Learn to be selfless. Learn to better yourself always, all right, so this is a picture of a sandworm. So the sandworm's like right in the middle of lunging at him. Sandworms are a class of phantozoid. I'm going to skip through a little bit of this just because I kind of want to get to my, my website before we wrap things up. Oh, this part is interesting too. This is that same plant that you saw earlier. But he was bit by this sort of poisonous leech and it made him hallucinate. So he looks at the plant while he's hallucinating and the plant talks to him and literally tells him, um, ferns like these have an anti-venom. The plant talks to him and tells him what it's good for. This is according to, you know, ancient traditions from various cultures and tribes. They say that whenever they take these certain medicines and plants, um, you know, most people call them illegal drugs today, but there's just plants that they chew on or, you know, turn into a brew or whatever. When they take these, their elders and their shamans and witch doctors and stuff say that the plants tell them what they're good for. That's how they get to be such good shamans. The plants literally talk to them and communicate, eat me or don't eat me or here's what I'm good for or stay away. You know, the plants talk to them. I thought that was a pretty good part of the movie. So then you have these uh, other humans who are survivors and they're totally just, tr they're pirates. Okay, so there's going to be pirates in the post-apocalyptic world. You're going to have people that are just still out for themselves and they try to just take advantage of other people. So, hey, be careful. Be careful. Not just because everyone survives, that means everyone's good. So, be careful. And then this girl starts getting drunk. Everybody on the beach starts getting drunk. I would highly advise against that um, just because I know a lot of people want to throw a party when it's the end of the world, but you also want to be sober-minded, okay? Maybe wait until everything's calmed down a bit to have your party or whatever, but you want to be sober-minded because you want to think clearly and be able to survive. Hey, KB just joined the Good Vibe Tribe, so hey, welcome to KB. Um, so I think you should get a little uh, thing here right underneath me in a bit. But hey, yeah, welcome. Thanks for joining and supporting my work, KB. I appreciate you. All right. So here's another phantozoid. As you can see, this one is like a giant crab, but it shows you it has an exoskeletal structure, right? And you would imagine if you saw this thing, there's KB, you get Rick and Morty. Nice. I like that. Going through the plasma conduit. That's why I put that up there. Anyway, um, so these are some phantozoids. You see they have an exoskeletal structure. And in the Bible and the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita, when, when they talk about these ancient monsters, okay? They talk about them having this sort of impenetrable skin. It's hard to kill them. It's hard to get through and actually kill them. And these are the types of things that you see. And I believe that a lot of them find refuge in our oceans or lakes or whatnot. And as time goes, you know, they grow. And then as the next apocalypse comes and our world starts to shrink again, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And those that have survived, you call seafood. I don't eat them. I don't want to. Okay. I don't eat crab or lobster. If you like it, all the more power to you. 
you hey but you're eating fanazoid babies basically <laughs> i don't know that's how i see it anyway all right so here's a cool picture of another one i you know i wanted to show you just to give you an idea of how large they could possibly be in comparison to us now right here's another picture now this is the part that I'm talking about. You would imagine that fighting this kind of a creature, like you would want to stay away or whatnot. But I talk about how there's good phanazoids or benevolent classes of phanazoids as well. And this girl talks about how you can just see it in their eyes. Look in their eyes. And this guy realized the phanazoid is not trying to fight him. It's trying to get free because it was being enslaved by this other dude. So instead of shooting it, he shoots the chain that it was attached to. And the phanazoid totally leaves him alone. It recognizes that he's got good vibes. He's knowing that he needs to mess with. He's not threatened by him. I took this picture just to show you that the world grows over. Okay. So you may be on a trek one day and see something very similar to this in a post-apocalyptic world because you're going to see nature just take over, all right? The, the, the vegetation will grow everywhere. And he says one last thing. Don't settle. He says don't settle. You don't have to, not even at the end of the world. So I try to give these messages because I believe that a lot of people are going through rough times. The energy is on high vibration right now. Everything's amplified. The world's going crazy. Don't settle. Don't give up. Don't give in. Continue to be who you are because you have some sort of a purpose, a destiny, a calling, whatever you want to call it, but you're important. So don't settle. Keep being you and keep doing what you do best because whatever you do to to do you the best way helps out with everybody else. And I believe it's going to help you in the end. I also just got a donation. I just want to read it. Uh, $10 from Get Lost In It says, The crab scene was one of my favorites. Hey, right on. Yeah, I, I totally love that scene because it shows the Phanazoid in all of its glory. But also, it shows you its eyes. And the eyes, that's the part I like the best whenever it shows you the eyes. And it's like, hey, not not just because something looks different doesn't mean that it's ugly doesn't mean that it's an enemy to you it's just different learn to get along learn to appreciate what others bring to the table by being different right i also got a donation a 199 pounds a dollar 99 pounds i don't know how to say that but thank you hey by that's an observer feeling uh pronoid paranoid paranoid all right so anyhow to end the movie this is how it ends the movie. It shows you that this guy gave his book to this girl and she's walking around with this group of survivors. It says Monster Apocalypse Survival Guide, Volume 1. So they have the courage now to walk around on the surface, to live again instead of living in fear and being afraid of these changes that have happened in the world. They have courage because of this guy's book. And then he continued to write more books. This one says... Monster Apocalypse Survival Guide Volume 2. He's doing his part. He thought he was an unnecessary part of it. He thought he sucked at survival. He was led by love. He ended up writing a book that's probably going to save hundreds of lives in the post-apocalyptic world. That's what this movie's all about. All right, cool. I want to show you guys a, a little piece, sneak peek of my website. Uh, let's see... All right, cool. Let me go ahead and go to the website. Where is it? Enter the Fantazoids. Here we go. So if you've never been to my website, there should be a link in the, in the description here. There we go. Okay, so this is my website. It used to be called jdreamers.com, but they didn't let, let me keep it because, you know, I had, to, uh, I had to pay a whole bunch of money to keep that. But anyways, uh, the link is totally in the description. And this is going to be under the Plasma Apocalypse. You go down to enter the Phantazoids right here. So that's where we are right now if you want to follow along. So enter the Phantazoids. A Phantazoid is a creature that travels the Fractalverse by sliding into realities that are either significantly larger, the Macroverse, or smaller, the Microverse, than its own. In other words, it's a microscopic life that is turned gigantic. And here's some examples, right? Off to the side here, you can see these are images of uh, creatures under an electron microscope. That's the microscopic world that you can't see with your eye, but we have to use special technology in order to zoom in on it to get an idea of what it looks like. Imagine if we lived in a fractal verse where something like this 
dropped down from the macrocosm above into our world, and all of a sudden it looks like something like this from our sci-fi and fantasy, uh, fantasy movies. The time of the phantasoids is short-lived but integral, an integral part of our collective subconscious. It is often alluded to in many of our greatest legends. It's the time of the mythic and legendary great beasts of old. It's the time of monsters, chimera, dragons, and more. Here's an example of one, the tardigrade. This is my favorite one. So if you see a little dude floating down right here, this is the tardigrade. That's my little tardigrade mascot. Um, he says, here are images of micro a microscopic creature known as the tardigrade. You might think it's some kind of a bug, but it's an animal. Here's one scratching its back on a cell, right? I wondered why is the tardigrade often depicted in art, science fiction, and fantasy as being titanic in stature? People draw these tardigrades and subconsciously they're drawing them huge. They're, they have people riding on top of tardigrades for some reason. Why? Why would you do that? I believe there's some truth to that. It's our subconscious knocking collectively and letting us know these creatures enter into our world. And hey, some are tameable, some we get along with and can actually ride. I also wondered why are they depicted living in space? After all, that's the one thing we tend to remember about them, that they can survive the vacuum of space. Interesting, right? That that's what we teach about the tardigrade. Well, space is out there. Why do we make such a big deal about these creatures living out there in space? Hmm, maybe they do live out there in space. And maybe out there in space, they're actually this big, as portrayed in Star Trek Discovery. Or Ant-Man, right? Then I remembered Alice's caterpillar in Wonderland, a titanic insect that was very much resembles a giant form of tardigrade. One side will make you larger. The other side will make you smaller. The outside of our world and the inside. I realized that living in a pressurized, enclosed system like we do today, the life forms adapt to such restrictions and growth uh, that they're stunted. Their growth is stunted. Those creatures living outside of our world or space may not have such restrictions that may grow to enormous sizes. They may grow huge. The tardigrade was the key. Why stop there, I thought. When the, when the world's barrier, the sky dome, opens, the phantasoids of all types fall or resurface into our realm, being altogether alien. This is a little video I made. This is available in my playlist as well. Being altogether alien, people described and named them as best as they could. But the phantasoids would die out relatively quick. Hungry and hunted, they perished. Out of place and far from home, it was a time of legendary creatures. Now, these are the different types. You can find this on my website. Like I said, there's a link in the description. So you've got the kaiju type, okay? Actually, let's talk about the classes first because it kind of goes from there, from right to left. You've got friendly class. They mean no harm. This type may tend to keep to themselves. They tend to be elusive. But if you can earn their trust, they may be helpful or useful. You've got the neutral class. This type does not seek out violence, but it will become so if provoked. Use caution. And then the, the hunter class. The hunter class is the type of phantasoids that are predators. They're looking for prey. These will be looking to infect, injure, or kill. They're very dangerous. Now, what types within those classes? You've got the kaiju type. They are like titans. Bigger than a building. Think Godzilla and King Kong. The worm type. Worm or snake-like. They tunnel into the soil and live in the water. Think sandworms. The bipedal type, often purposeful travelers of the fractalverse, think humanoid. And then, of course, the creature type. Usually, they take unusual forms, many arms or legs, and often has an exoskeletal type body. Think about chimera or chimera, however you like to pronounce it. Phantasoids come in many varieties. The categories and subcategories that they fall into may change as they are further researched. They may also share types. For example, there may be a neutral class that is both a kaiju and a biped type. Use caution with all phantasoids. Even friendly class kaiju type could injure or kill accidentally, right? 
If they're that big, they're not going to know if they're stepping on you, just like you don't know if you're stepping on ants on the ground. Oh, hey, Mario knows it's flat. Just bought a torque mug. Oh, man, that's cool. Man, I'm excited for you. How sweet. I don't even have a torque mug yet. I got to get one. <laughs> Mother Dragons in the chat says, J Dreamers, they live, uh, they live, feed image is not working right. The sound is fine, but the image is lagging. Oh, that's weird. I wonder why. I'm not sure. Thanks for letting me know. Mr. Dynamics in the chat and says, J Dreamers, what if we are giants of old renown and grow after the PSI drops? I totally agree. That's very much possible, right? I think that actually does happen. All right, let's continue on. Remember, many fanazoids will not survive in their new environment for very long. There's a reason why we do not see many of them around in our realm today. They may be afraid, confused, hungry, and disoriented. Many will die out within the first few months of their survival or their arrival. Those phantazoids who are able to find a safe place will likely become local legends like the Loch Ness Monster. Those phantazoids who find a safe place to reproduce, typically in the ocean, will most likely adapt to their new mesocosm, that's their new norm, uh, what was once a microverse to them, their progeny shrinking down to match the size of their new realm. I am thus far.